Hi, everybody. Um, this is Erin Schneider at CityMatch, and um, we are doing the CityMatch Learning Network webinar, Public Policy 101, featuring the Honorable Tanya Cook. Um, I went through all of this before, but I'll go through it again. <laughs> again, apologies. Um, to unmute your line, press star 7. Um, we're, we have all the lines muted right now, obviously, because that's why you couldn't hear us. <laughs> um, so anyway, without further ado, I'm going to go into um, Tanya's bio quickly, and then we will have her start. So um, Tanya Cook is the former state senator elected to represent Legislative District 13 in the Nebraska Unicameral in 2008, and she was reelected in 2012. Prior to the 2008 election, no African American woman had been elected to the Nebraska State Legislature. A fierce advocate for families working their way out of poverty, quality public education, and access to affordable health care, Cook also led the fight for equal pay for women during her time as a policymaker. Cook served as a member of the Appropriations Committee and chaired the Legislators Planning Committee. She is the president of City Girl Communications, Consulting Practice, and Civic Engagement. A graduate of Georgetown University, Cook enjoys film, books, theater, and travel. She has visited 30 countries around the globe, including Argentina, Japan, Zambia, and Ukraine, as an international election monitor. Senator Cook has received numerous awards and recognitions, including ACLU Civil Libertarian of the Year, NAACP Community Le Leadership Award, and Legislator of the Year by the National Black Caucus of State Legislators in Washington, D.C. So I will turn it over to Tanya. Thank you very much, Erin, and welcome, everyone. This is a presentation that goes from very basic information about public policy to examples of how you can engage and re-engage in the public policy making process as a local health department leader. So with that, let's get to the first slide. A textbook definition of public policy Public policy is composed of national constitutional laws and regulations. Constitutional simply means that they are derived and not in conflict with the principles and the guidelines set forth in the United States Constitution. I'm certain you have heard of examples in which judicial interpretations have changed law in some cases very dramatically, judicial interpretations and regulations which are generally authorized by legislation is another definition of public policy. And we like to see public policy that is strong because it addresses a problem in a clear way that can be executed at whatever levels of government that public policy needs to be executed at. Another sign that it's good public policy is that it encourage, encourages engagement among all citizens, particularly those that are going to be impacted by the policy change. Here are the three levels of policy. I have mentioned earlier that laws in the United States are, worked, are, are born of the framework of the United States Constitution, which has been amended, as you're aware, many, many times. The first level of policy makers or lawmakers would be the 535 members of the United States Congress. That would be 100 United States senators, two from each state in the union, and 435 representatives in the House of Representatives. And the number of representatives from your state or from your district is in proportion to the population. And those population districts uh, are determined based on the census that happens every 10 years in the United States. So federal law is the kind of the top layer. State law, those are made by state legislators and in-state legislative bodies. Sometimes those are brand new laws. Again, they could not be out of line with federal law or the U.S. Constitution. And then, of course, there are local laws which cannot be out of line with what the state permits or what the United States 
code or USC permits. So those are the levels of policy. They often overlap, sometimes based on judicial interpretations and because of states' rights. They may differ from state to state, but they cannot be out of line with the federal law. So how a bill becomes a law. This is, I'm going to point you at the end of this presentation to a resource that shows a video, not the one which many of us grew up with uh, on Schoolhouse Rock, but a video that shows a process of an idea becoming a law. What happens is an issue or a philosophy is, is introduced. And the idea for how to address an issue, let's say it is disproportionate number, numbers of African American women dying uh, in childbirth or after childbirth. Then there is a lawmaker or an advocacy group or a citizen that brings forward an idea about how to address that issue. That issue, is, that idea, is put into the appropriate legal language and the appropriate section of the law. And the way that is done is through a bill proposal. So we have an idea, let's say it is, addressing the disproportionate number of African and women, African American women who die in, in childbirth. And there's an idea perhaps to take a baby step toward this, addressing this disparity. Maybe the idea is to collect data. What is, we don't even know necessarily if there's data upon which to build a program. So the bill proposal would include a description of the problem, and it would identify the sections of the law that would need to be added to or changed in order to get at this data. So that is what the bill proposal is. And I would, I wanted to give an example, but then I realized that this was a national webinar, so I didn't want to get too much into what a bill looks like in Nebraska compared to what it might look like in your state. But they're pretty um, similar. Uh, ordinarily, a bill will have a sponsor or several sponsors. If I were sponsoring this bill, I would try to get uh, other people to co-sponsor that weren't necessarily directly engaged with the issue, so that way I can demonstrate broad support outside of my own district or outside of my own particular constituency or constituencies. So that is the bill proposal. The bill proposal is recorded in the, by the parliamentarian of whatever the body is. It is often read out loud into the record that is going to be considered by that legislative body, and then it is assigned to be heard in public to assigned to a committee so that the committee can facilitate a public hearing for that bill proposal. The example that I just gave to you would most likely be referred to the Health and Human Services Committee if it were a bill proposal in the state of Nebraska. As I said, different states have different committees, but you would be really uh, hurting if you did not have some sort of health committee or human services committee or, or data committee in your state or public health committee. Some, some states even have a separate committee for public health distinct from other kinds of health. So you have a hearing. Ideally, people show up for that hearing. And when I say ideally people show up, I recognize that the people that our citizens have day jobs, they have responsibilities with their own families. Uh, I liked, I felt like a successful state senator when there were people engaged to speak on behalf of the audiences that are really going to be impacted down the line by the bill proposal. So not saying anything 
rude or unkind about my friends who earn their livings as lobbyists or government relations professionals, but uh, the I feel like a good part of the process is to ensure that it is not only in line with the interests that those lobbyists represent. So there's a committee hearing. This can take place. Boy, I've been in committee hearings that take 10 minutes, and I've been in committee hearings that take eight hours. So it depends on the if, whether the advocates, the community advocates, uh, the media, the, as I mentioned earlier, government relations professionals or lobbyists, if they've kind of gotten the word out and it's sometimes perceived to be um, controversial, you could have a packed hearing room with overflow or you can have just two or three people. So that's the committee hearing. There is a record kept of that committee hearing by a committee clerk. So it's kept uh, in videotape, audio tape, and in writing of everyone who shows up to testify in support of the bill. They keep a record of people who testify just with technical knowledge, the impact of the bill on whatever it is they do. And there are uh, groups that sometimes testify in opposition to, to bills and um, often offer apocalyptic outcomes if the bill were to be made into a law. So after that process, there are amendments. In my eight years of serving in the Nebraska unicameral legislature, I do not recall even one bill, the least controversial, a one-pager, a one-paragraph bill proposal that did not have some sort of change, edit, or amendment introduced to it ideally at the committee level, and we'll get to ideally, why ideally in a minute. So then the committee advances that bill proposal in the, a new form, because it's been amended by that committee, advances it to consideration by the full legislative body. So the full legislative body in Nebraska means 49 people, all called state senators, in most states and at the federal level, it is two houses. So if you have a two house legislature, which most legislative bodies are, will start in the lower house or the house of representatives or uh, assembly, in California you're called them assembly, in Maryland they're called delegates, and there is a debate on the bill. Now this is when uh, theoretically, you would have done a good job about telling your friends, hopefully the person that at least sits next to you on the floor is going to help you vote for your bill, telling people about the not just the benefit to your constituencies, but to the state as a whole or to the United States government as a whole or to the city or county as a whole. This is when um, you might expect some opposition because lots of people wait to put their two cents in after they see that the bill is progressing toward becoming a law. So if you are proposing a policy, a bill, here you are, you're up, you give your introduction, you are prepared for questions, and you might take a clue from what happened in your committee hearing, so you're not completely caught out of left field, about what questions emerged and you've done your homework so you were able to answer those questions when the bill proposal is before the full body so that you're not kind of caught flat-footed. So it would be the rare lawmaker that got a question that she or he didn't anticipate. And that even goes back to when you were doing your research and got the idea. Maybe you got the idea by attending a a community meeting uh, when you were not in legislative session. Those, all the research that you did to make the bill a bill proposal should also be included. You should be ready with those kinds of answers when you're in a debate mode. Okay, so it, let's just decide that it has gone well. 
yay us, yay advocates, yay sponsoring senator, representatives, whoever you are. It's voted, advanced in Nebraska. There are three rounds of full debate. If somebody decided that they were feeling ornery that day or they didn't like you, and maybe nothing personal, maybe just something else they are cranky about, in Nebraska you can go six hours on that first round of debate You're before the rules say you've got to stop and call for a vote. Then you could go another four hours on that next round of debate before there's a call to end uh, the discussion in advance, then you could go another two hours on it, and it's happened before. So ideally, we don't run into all that. We are voting with a, with a healthy engagement across different interest groups and across different representatives, and then it goes on to the governor's desk for signature. Now we talk about governors signing bills into law. It does not necessarily become law the nanosecond she signs it. In Nebraska, it, there, unless you put an emergency clause in your bill proposal, it will be 90 days. So that's another 90 days. Somebody can jump up and decide, oh, no, this is not a good idea. The governor signs it. There's also such a thing as a governor vetoing a bill or vetoing parts of an appropriation, in which case you as a sponsoring senator and your allies need to pull it together enough votes to override whatever your rules say in that body, pull enough votes together to override, whether it's a governor's veto, president's veto, whatever your procedure is, that those are parts of the checks and balances of the three branches of government. So let's think positively. She signs it. It's a law. Yay. Any questions? You can, you can put your ch questions in the chat box, or you can push star seven to unmute your line. Nothing. Okay, Good. great. Very, very thorough discussion. Exactly. <laughs> so also jump right in there um, if it's too basic and you've got some things specific you want to teach out. So I bet after that last slide you thought we were home free, that we worked hard in our communities and with our neighbors and, and, uh, and with our strange bedfellows and, and got a bill turned into a law. I bet you thought that. Well, now there's another opportunity for the intention of your idea to not necessarily be carried out by the agency that has jurisdiction over your proposed change in the law or expansion of the law. The branches of government are the executive branch. They that carries out the law. So the agency, the Department of Health and Human Services is an agency with a cabinet member that is appointed by the executive, usually. Usually the sitting executive of the state or of the country or of the uh, county. So what ideally your rules and regs procedure, rules and regulations procedure is how specifically, tactically, this law will be carried out. As I mentioned or alluded to, if you're in the legislative branch and you've done all your work and you want to help people and you've got this thing across the finish line, there may be another opportunity if the human being who happens to have dominion over the executive branch of the political subdivision for some additional tinkering with the rules and regulations process. 
it can simply be dragged out. I've seen regulations sit for literally four years <laughs> while they're reviewed and passed back and forth between agency personnel and the executive branch. I've also seen key parts and key aspects of the legislation not put forth tactically in the regulations. So it's a strange way almost of ignoring the fact that there is a new law just by, okay, well, here are the regs. Please um, rubber stamp them. It's like, wait a minute. We said that we wanted to collect data in this way. There's no money for it. There, it's not even here that you have to do it or you're saying that you're going to get it from another source. So this is, it's, a, it's a marathon, folks. <laughs> it's not a sprint, and one has to remain engaged and vigilant after the, every step of the way and not feel as though uh, political opportunities to undo or more likely just not do things won't be taken advantage of. So still Help. more time. Okay. Any questions Hi. at that point? Yes. Hi, um, thank you so much. It's always great to hear another fellow FOIA out there doing Yay! great work. <laughs> Hi, my name is Lillian Green. I do have a question. So um, in regards to this conversation around thinking about this process as the marathon, um, as we are getting, especially as we're thinking about like the, the development of rules, how, what are some suggestions that you would have around ensuring that the legislative intent of the bill that we're trying to move through is maintained through that process? Has there been any helpful hints or mm -hmm. helpful tips that you have developed over the years around ensuring that as we're entering into that rules and regulation process? Well, thank you very much for bringing it up that you do need to remain engaged. Um, I've been to many pizza parties where people are celebrating that the law got passed or even that the bill got introduced and we're not anywhere close. Here are the hints I would, I would uh, apply. Whoever the sponsoring senator or representative or assemblywoman or assembly person is, stay connected with their office because it is their staff or the committee staff that is going to have the most interest in ensuring that their idea really gets carried out by the agency. So that would probably be my top hint. And while he or she is still in office, they can pick up the telephone and call the agency. The, I used to send letters to agency directors so that there was a physical record that I wrote to the CEO of the Nebraska Department of Health and Human Services. And I asked her at the time, hey, what is the status of my child care subsidy <laughs> expansion? Can you tell me? about that and then it is in writing that you um, are working on it and then you can also, and I'm going to hit this a little bit later, just make certain that you're in touch with the sponsoring senator or the or committee to find out what that is and if your sponsoring representative can go kind of back where she started and say, hey, community, remember that time I introduced that bill proposal and it was signed in everything? Did you know? And then there's a way to engage, re-engage neighbors, um, advocacy groups, nonprofit groups that can advocate um, in more than one branch in ways that do not jeopardize their 501. C3. So that would be my advice. We have another question. Um, have you ever experienced having a bill sent to a committee that isn't familiar with the issue? Yes. In fact, that is another tactic, <laughs> a political tactic. I'm kind of raising the, the, the veil. Sometimes if, an, if a bill proposal is not say, popular with the, the, um, the widely held philosophy within the body, the committee that is charged with assignment of bill proposals 
to committee will use that power to assign it to a committee that is perhaps less friendly and open to that policy change. So it's not even uh, the representatives or senators are like, oh boy, tell me more about ABC XYZ idea. It has been referred on purpose to a committee that would otherwise not be interested. Let's say they will view that as an expansion of the size of government or an opportunity to increase taxation. So that happens and it is a tactic that I wish weren't as successful because that means more work on behalf of the sponsoring legislator and more work on behalf of the advocates and, and uh, people that come to support the legislation if they've got to uh, try to work an uphill battle in an unfriendly committee. Those are good questions. If you have any other questions, you can push star seven to unmute your line. Okay, well, let's keep going. All right, well, how about this? There you are with your blank slate in your local health department. Let's say we've made it through all the trickery and mischief of the lawmaking process to create a new program or to expand a program. The power that you have within local health departments to execute the program include how you design the program. We're going to design it ideally so that the impacted community is engaged in a direct fashion and not a top-down fashion. Take more ownership of it. It usually costs less money, too. Uh, if you're in a budget-making position, you're going to put resources, human and otherwise. Maybe you're going to even leverage resources from the nonprofit or from the, um, the philanthropic community to maximize the impact of your program. And this was always my challenge when I would talk to my colleagues. It didn't seem that the kinds of priorities that were put forth in the budget, which is considered a moral document by many people. The appropriations should reflect the values of the state, whether it's the United States of America, the state of Nebraska, the area. So what often didn't happen is that we say we care about babies and healthy moms and, and life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. What you have an opportunity to do at the local health department, I hope, is to set those priorities in line with what you know about your community. Um, I had the opportunity when I served to sponsor a bill that put forth, in appropriations terms, a nominal amount of money, but it was money put forth to each of our state's health departments to move their agenda forward. And it went county by county or local health department by local health department. They each identified a different priority. But they had the power in Douglas County I, in Nebraska, I think they put forward an initiative related to teen pregnancy and sexually transmitted infection. In another county, they put forward an initiative to address smoking. So these are opportunities that exist. I apologize because I know across this country there's never enough money that flows down to local health departments, but what we know is that because you care so much about advocating on behalf of the health of individuals in your community, you know how to make a good batch of stone soup, and I want to take this opportunity to thank you, but make setting those priorities. So the next thing, that really maximizes or puts a flavor in that stone soup is how you engage community. I mentioned at the beginning that lots of times ideas for bill proposals, at least the kinds of bills 
that I like to sponsor came out of listening to uh, emerging issues within the district or within audiences that were represented within my district. So I think there's great opportunity for uh, local health departments to really engage, as I mentioned earlier, with nonprofit organizations. They don't necessarily have to be a nonprofit that is health and human service focused. Maybe it's an arts nonprofit. Maybe it's a, a nonprofit particularly related to climate change or environmental justice. But there are ways to work creatively with in community partnership with nonprofit organizations. And as I said earlier, those policymakers that you notice are putting forth proposals that are in line with the needs that you see within your jurisdiction, keeping them engaged. Maybe not ideally when they're in the throes of floor debate or throes of budget making, but inviting policymakers and their staffs to community events or keeping them on your listserv or even a hard copy newsletter, uh, maybe you know, this is a political process. Maybe there's an opportunity if Senator ABC shows up at your anti-smoking event, why not take a picture of her and feature it in your newsletter or on your website? That is a way to stay engaged as the process goes through. Um, this is my strange bedfellow scenario because as I was doing research for this webinar, uh, some of the input I got was, boy, look at this environment we're navigating. It's like, you know, am I stepping on a stone or is it a crocodile? <laughs> or am I going to be pulled into some sort of um, like a foundry in a Batman movie <laughs> where it's just dangerous chemicals everywhere? How do I stay engaged? Excuse me. I'm not going to say it's easy, but I'm going to tell you what one of my favorite uh, committee chair chairs told me and told all of us as we were diving particularly into these very human uh, bill proposals where you felt like, how can somebody not vote for this and hold the values? What she said was, keep your eye on the ball because in any environment there's going to be a lot of noise a lot of negative, icky energy, a lot of accusations that are flying back and forth. And what you need to do is keep your eye on, I want this change, I will die on this hill. This bill proposal might include lots of things. It might include being fully funded, adding staff people at all levels, but you know what you want out of it at the end of the day, or you know what cannot happen if you're playing defense for a bill that kind of undoes 50 years worth of progress in public health or in health or in human development. My strange bedfellows, many of you are familiar with that. Uh, I would attribute something like that to Shakespeare, wouldn't you? Somebody can Google it. Anyway, politics makes strange bedfellows. And you would think that the whole time you are yelling at the person with the opposite philosophical view. But most of the time when you're making policy, you are working together to ensure that everybody walks away a little bit dissatisfied, but with something that they can live with until they fight another day. The example that springs to mind for me right now is a bill proposal came forward about a license plate. Now, until recently, our state did not permit specialty license plates. But a number of years ago, that language to permit specialty license plates went through, and then there emerged different kinds of specialty license plates. Well, one of the specialty license plates picked an issue, you know, it's a little bit of a hot button issue uh, about when life begins. So that can be a very controversial and very um, 
emotional issue because it's very closely tied to where people live in their spiritual homes. So there was a license plate that put forth the philosophy of one side of the abortion issue. So many people might think, well, I hope I bet my representative better vote one way or the other on this. Otherwise, I'm done with her. And I and this is what what you would want to do though is if you were to read that particular bill proposal and the version that was signed into law, the funds that are generated for all of these license plates goes into a pot of money that, let's just say, doesn't necessarily have the same philosophy as you might uh, be reflected on the outside of the license plate. So there's section of the bill, there, there's there sections of the bills which refer to not only how much it's going to cost to implement, but how much money maybe it can generate, and there are opportunities to direct the revenue into a pot of money that can serve a broad audience of people if you are in the conversation. You've got to be in dialogue and in, not just in a philosophical posture, in a floor debate and putting forth a political, large letter P, political point of view Real good policy comes from people talking to each other and crafting things out, things that people can live with. Are there any questions on that before I go further? You can put that in the chat box or star seven. We have a question that says, are there appropriate channels to contact legislators if the local health department is, even with state funding, lacking local support, staff funds, et cetera, to design, implement, or evaluate the program as required by the law and rules? Okay, thank you. That's a perfectly crafted question because that is exactly the situation I know that you are in. As I mentioned earlier, you're not funded nearly to what you would need. Here's what I would challenge you to do. First of all, make sure you read your own employee handbook to determine, I know department by department, there are different guidelines about how and whether you can engage the legislative body as a whole or even your own legislator. So my challenge to you is first, read your employee handbook. Second, find out who your own legislator is what is her or his name, because you as a citizen are permitted to engage with your legislator on the federal level your, or, or staff. Staff is sometimes better because staff can, is focused narrowly issue by issue. Your staff in your state or perhaps you've got a representative on the county commission or the city council or on the board of health engage with that person as a citizen who's a voter who has an address within their jurisdiction. I think that's the, if I were to identify safe and appropriate channels for contact, I would start there. There's also such a thing as when you're a private citizen and there are a bunch of people running for office. I know you're very busy people. You've often got evening events and lunchtime events and breakfast events. But if you're going to engage with a candidate when they are a candidate, that's a very good way to just be able to walk up there and introduce yourself and say, hey, my name is Tanya and I'm very interested in health disparities uh, between and among minorities and or the disproportionate number of African American women that die in childbirth. Uh, do you have a position on this issue or would you mind if I sent you some information on this issue? So engaging with candidates, let me tell you that it's sometimes helpful for a brand new candidate to find an issue that really resonates with them and they can speak about with passion and they kind of gain confidence in that way, and then you've made that relationship for when they're elected to be able to be an expert or a resource 
to them while they're in office and they feel kind of secure and uh, tr you have, you've built a, the beginning, beginnings of a trusting relationship with them. Hope that helps. Okay. So that's my example of a strange bedfellows. You think you're looking at that license plate. If you're like me, you're, you're feeling, boy, that's annoying. I don't like looking at the back of that license plate or where's my Tanya Cook license plate? Darn it. And then what I need you remember is like, oh, there is more to the story. It could be a license plate. It could be funding. There are more that, there's more than one way that that can go. Some resources. Uh, this particular technology did not permit the showing of a video, but there is an organization here. And City Match is a member of this organization. It's called Coalition for a Strong Nebraska. I'm a volunteer on their leadership team, and they have a website. There's a little video about how a bill becomes a law in a state house, and there are just uh, some guidelines about uh, quote unquote safe territory through which to advocate. In your case, if you're advocating through a nonprofit organization as a community partner, ways that they can um, safely approach lawmakers and not risk losing their tax-free status. Another thing I found uh, when I've been active with the National Black Caucus of State Legislatures and no legislators around the country, going to websites of state legislatures, as I have, you just put in there, in the little search bar, maternal deaths or maternal child health, and then it will bring up the laws or even the bill proposals from that session related to that. So you can know maybe there's a bill, you, your state senator or your state rep or your member of Congress is not on the same page as you are, <laughs> maybe. But maybe you can find in partnership with your nonprofits or even the philanthropic community in some cases, legislators that are and what their agenda might be. So just doing a little research. Boards of Health publish agendas. I'm a little nerdy and geeky, and I will read agendas and minutes because I was taught a long time ago that the source document is your best document, and I understand all of the benefits of traditional media and social media, but that's already gone through the lens and it's through the lens of the philosophy of the owner of the traditional media or the individual that is using social media to put a point of view forward. So I'm just a big advocate. Again, I'm giving you more work to do, and I know you're already working very hard, but reading agendas, minutes, Background information can give you a leg up and really help your advocate, your legislative advocate, do their work because that's what people need. Also, as I mentioned earlier, I would start with what your employee handbook or what the thing you signed when you came on board to work says about how you can engage and advocate. A, I think an organization, a health department, would be hard-pressed to tell you that you cannot advocate on your own time. In fact, I hope that they are giving you time off to vote or in some places even volunteer at polling places or volunteer for a candidate or for an issue. But I would just ensure that for myself because if you aren't working there anymore, you can't help <laughs> move these conversations forward in any of your partnerships or in any of your collaborations. So I'm going to ask for more questions at this point. I, I'm not seeing any popping up in the written text bar. Let me look at the pieces of paper in front of me because I don't want to walk away from you and get to the car and think, oh, shoot, I meant to tell them that. 
I think I've given you a good um, kind of inside baseball view of the policy making procedure so that first of all you don't get too comfortable that you have shared the idea and great it's a bill there's a long long way to go to ensure that that idea becomes a law and becomes a law that is carried out or in some cases enforced like if some audience is being harmed and you go to the trouble and work over years and years with a legislator or several legislators and then this audience is still made or kept vulnerable or another thing that happens in the policy making process is that you've heard of the term unintended consequences you identify an idea this is great this is going to help uh, address intergenerational poverty as it presents itself in my community and then you find out you are maybe creating a crime <laughs> which is exacerbating some of the situations of the audience of the intended audience so you know, unintended consequences keeping your eye on the ball it's a long-term engagement this I spoke earlier about a, my second to last priority bill which was a, related to the federal child care subsidy addressing the issue of the cliff effect that means people not being able to take a raise or a promotion because they would lose a significant amount of money toward their child care. Mm -hmm. Well, guess what happened? There, I was walking arm in arm with our state's governor. I was mentioned in the State of the State address. There, people stood up and clapped. And then the next year when the money wasn't there, guess what? <laughs> the program or the expansion was pulled back. Now what I asked for in my bill proposal and more and more bill proposals are putting it in for accountability's sake because the last thing I would want to do is pass a law and then it doesn't work and then it just stays there for no good reason is to require reporting. So I was lucky enough to get within that first year a number of families impacted, ideally helped through the bill and I'm hoping that my colleagues that stayed on after me can use that to build it back up to the level uh, that we left it at for my priority bill. So as I said, it's a long road and I certainly appreciate each and every one of you and the, the work that you do because you really get to see what's going on in your communities. Um, I feel lucky that before I became an elected official, before I was an aide to a governor, that I was able to participate in a public health leadership cohort and I did a lot of work related to careers and health education. So I met people and got to learn their stories and I was, I hope, able to share those stories with my colleagues. Lots of times because of the way that our, the uh, way candidates are identified, the way that life works, uh, women cannot always engage in running for high elected office, maybe until they're, if they've got family, because we always have family responsibilities, let's face it. Um, so there might not be as much direct knowledge about how things really work. So that makes your role in educating legislators, educating your collaborators who interface with legislators, on what is really going on in their districts. That's another tip I want to leave you. To the degree that you can narrow down the data related to each legislative district and target it toward the audience that the legislator is representing, that again builds her or his confidence to be comfortable with the pedagogy but also to be able to argue and represent their constituency well and with their colleagues. So thank you very much again for your work. There I am, my living room. <laughs> thank you very much, Tanya. And I will leave it open for just a smidge longer. If you have a question, you can press star seven or put it in the chat box. I'm back. I thought of something else. 
Uh, looking at this last slide, uh, we asked how to engage with legislators. Someone told me when I was first elected to keep a file folder of thank you notes. And I've kept that file folder even since I've left the legislature. There are there is a lot of maybe criticism or, or input um, for a legislator. There aren't many thank yous. <laughs> even a thank you for introducing a bill or a even if the bill doesn't make it all the way, or sometimes a thank you for getting a bill passed, but that will distinguish you as an individual or as an organization, or it will distinguish your issue with you if you thank the sponsoring legislator or the group of legislators or the governor, that's the case. Thank you, Tanya. Thank you. Good, good tips. Um, I will be sending out an email shortly after we end the call today um, that will have the recording and also um, have a sh very, very short evaluation that we would love for you to fill out. So thanks again to Tanya. Thank you all for joining us today, and we will talk to you soon. Thanks.